welcome to the first session of our winter term money webinar series by the Institute of International Monetary Research in collaboration with the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. I'm Dr. Juan Castañeda, Director of the IMR, and today we'll be hosting Professor Dimitrios Somokos. Dimitrios Somokos is a professor of financial economics at Said Business School and a fellow in management at St. Edmund Hall, University of Oxford. A mathematical economist by trade, his main areas of expertise include central banking, banking and regulation, incomplete asset markets, systemic risk and financial instability. Dimitri's research has had a substantial impact on economic policy around the world. In particular, he analyzes issues of contagion, financial fragility, and the impact of Basel Accord and financial regulation in the microeconomy, using a general equilibrium model with incomplete asset markets, money, and endogenous default. He's working towards designing a new paradigm of monetary policy, financial stability analysis, and macro potential regulation. He co-developed with uh, uh, the Goodhart uh, Somokos model of financial fragility in 2003 while working at the Bank of England. More than 10 central banks have calibrated the model, including the Bank of Bulgaria, Bank of Colombia, Bank of England, and the Bank of Korea. Dimitri has been an economic advisor to one of the main political parties in Greece and regularly provides commentary on the state of the Greek economy to local and international media. In 2011, Dimitri provided testimony to the House of Lords for the Economic and Financial Affairs and International Trade Subcommittee's report on the future of economic governance in the European Union. He also serves as a senior research associate at the Financial Market Group at the LSE. And prior to joining the Said Business School in, in 2002, Dimitri was an economist at the Bank of England. He holds a BA, an MA, MPhil and PhD from Yale University. Professor Somokos will discuss today the role of money in modern microeconomic modeling with a specific focus on defaults and financial stability, after which we will allow time for Q&A with viewers at home. Today's presentation will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. Questions must be submitted via the chat option and I will moderate them and address the speaker. Dimitri, you have a very kindly uh, contributed to, to our events in the past and we are very grateful for your collaboration with the Institute and indeed delighted to host your webinar today. So the floor is entirely yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Juan, for the invitation. And indeed, I feel among friends. I only wished that I would be physically uh, in your seminar series uh, to have our event. Hopefully, uh, the pandemic will be over sooner rather than later, and we'll be able uh, to be again uh, in your wonderful campus. So today, uh, I'll try uh, to give uh, a general talk regarding the role of money and default in modern macroeconomic modeling, in a way that a soul-searching uh, presentation, because I'll try to summarize my work over the last, I don't even want to remember how many years, more than uh, 15 years of work that primarily has been done jointly with uh, Charles Goodhart. In fact, the motivating, in fact, the motivating uh, sentence for the entire talk uh, is something that we wrote in a paper that's published uh, in the handbook of uh, central banking, uh, jointly written with the late Martin Schubert, my supervisor, Charles, and a uh, former DFIL student of mine. Uh, default is to macroeconomics, what seem is uh, to theology. Uh, regrettable, but always central and essential. In fact, if we want to talk about financial instability, if we want to talk about financial instability and we want to model it properly and in an analytically tractable way, we need to fulfill some minimum structure characteristics that any model should possess. Namely, uh, we should have uh, dynamics, we should have aggregate uncertainty and agent heterogeneity. Agent heterogeneity 
has been always central to our approach. Moreover, since we talk about financial instability, liquidity and money should possess uh, a central role and their importance may be primary. And money, together with default, because one can think of money and default as the two sides of the same coin, then in order for liquidity and default to have uh, uh, a consequential role and not to be just a veil and an out of equilibrium phenomenon, a commercial banking sector as well as a regulatory framework should be preeminent and should have special standing in the modeling. However, one of the main things when we started back uh, in the day at the Bank of England to work with Charles Goodhart on financial stability and to try to emulate, if you will, uh, what had been done uh, all along up until the early 2000s on monetary policy, a very natural question than any young economist might have would be what's the definition of financial stability? What do we mean by financial stability? In fact, I vividly remember at the time we were six people in the room uh, trying to dissect the problem and get the project going and we had, believe me, more than five definitions of financial instability. Nevertheless, I'll present our take later on. So the main, the main, if you will, tenet of our monetary economics to deal with financially unstable situations, which we consider that it is compatible with the orderly function of uh, the market, is default and moreover is endogenous default. The default, the way we uh, perceive it in economics as compared to the Merton type of default where what we see in finance, where the default probabilities is a random variable. For us, uh, default is costly uh, to both the creditor and the debtor via the bankruptcy code. To the market, because it causes a negative externality that is worsened by adverse selection. Moreover, it may collapse to the implosion of the asset markets, whereby asset markets may be uh, lopsided and assets may not be traded. Uh, in addition, when we have missing financial markets, in other words, when not all unforeseen contingencies cannot be insured ex ante, uh, default alters uh, the technical terms is the spanning of the asset matrix by providing extra insurance and extra spanning opportunities to investors and allows the debtor to customize, to customize and to tailor make his own insurance opportunities and proclivities. Uh, moreover, agents can be on both sides, can be on both sides of the market. And this is the concept of pooling. So our objective will be <coughs> to model default as an equilibrium phenomenon that it is compatible with the orderly function of the markets. So default uh, is an institution that we have to learn to live with and moreover we have to develop policies to mitigate it and preempt it and if and when it occurs to manage. So together with incomplete asset markets and liquidity that will give us models of financial fragility. And consequently, regulation will affect default, insurance opportunities and quantities trade. And that, since we have uh, an economy with externalities and inefficiencies, the welfare depends on policy intervention and regulatory intervention whereby regulatory intervention is separate and oftentimes complementary with monetary policy. Default, uh, basically, uh, is a decision variable or a bad luck. Uh, costs uh, are reflected in the margins, are reflected in the margins, or uh, we have, uh, when you lose your collateral, your collateral is foreclosed, or moreover, when you have non-pecuniary penalties. And the idea of modeling default along these lines goes back uh, 
but the seminal paper by Chuck Wilson and my intellectual forefather Martin Schubick uh, and this argument of modeling a bankruptcy code has been advanced and be put in a more rigorous framework by Dubey, Genacopoulos and Schubick in 2005. Uh, so, let us see, uh, perhaps this is one of the most powerful intuitions that Martin offered to the profession, whereby tries to dissect uh, the importance of default. Let us assume that we have a two-agent economy, Mr. 1 and Mr. 2, and this is the Aro de Bre uh, Pareto Optimal Service. When we have default, evidently, since default has an externality, uh, and is associated with a particular bankruptcy code lambda, uh, then uh, we don't have uh, the ability to arrive at the Pareto optimal surface. Therefore, we are in the third best. And the question becomes, what is the optimal bankruptcy code? Uh, and the optimal bankruptcy code, it turns out not to be way too lenient. Remember, there are certain cases when you bankrupt, and the more times you bankrupt, the higher up you go. You may even make it to the presidency of the United States, or if you have a very stringent bankruptcy code, you may end up decimating uh, markets. And it turns out that the optimal default penalty is an intermediate penalty, which is greater than zero, if you wish, and less than infinity. What does this mean? It means that default should be sufficiently harsh so that to preclude strategic default, but sufficiently lenient, not to penalize ill faith and ill fortune, and hence not to kill the risk taking behavior of investors. Moreover, after this fundamental intuition, uh, in the very old paper uh, of Martin Schubert with myself when I was a graduate student, we tried to dissect and we tried uh, we tried basically uh, to uh, compare and contrast the trade-off between liquidity and default. So if we have some sort of a gearing ratio uh, in the paper, uh, we had a gearing ratio, so we had a mutual bank where banks could extend fiat money and the gearing ratio is K, whereas uh, the lambda corresponds to the bankruptcy code, then the case where we have the optimal amount of money and the optimal default penalty is a case that uh, corresponds to a no default and the Friedman rule where interest rates are zero. When we have uh, a more lenient, a more lenient uh, default penalty, like the case where lambda is less than lambda star and k equals k star, then the marginal benefit of defaulting is higher than the marginal uh, cost of defaulting, therefore you have a price shift and a default, and then you introduce the concept of, sorry, you introduce the concept of credit risk. Likewise, it may be the case where you have, uh, when you have uh, an expansion in monetary policy uh, and, a, and, a, and a, an expansion monetary policy and a very stringent default penalty, which is the bottom right square, you may have no default because the marginal cost is higher than the marginal benefit, but you may have possibly deflation or inflation. And since you have no default, no credit risk and the interest rates will be zero. Therefore, we see already back in the 90s, back in the 90s, the old intuitions of Keynesian economics of the trade off between liquidity and default, as have been articulated by economists like Jim Tobin, uh, and others, uh, we, we can reappear in a fully-fledged, closed model that is general equilibrium. But mind you, as I will uh, mention later on more explicitly, a necessary requirement for this argument to go through is agent heterogeneity. And we'll talk more about this later on. Uh, now, I will skip uh, the technicalities in this talk, in the interest of time, may, be, uh, may come back in the Q&A, but basically here, all what we say, the way we model default is by introducing a non-pecuniary cost of default, which will be pro proportional to the amount of your debt. Uh, 
and the properties that this argument uh, give you, it gives you now a new uh, variable, which is your repayment rate or your endogenous decision whether or not to default and how much, and agents will completely default on their asset obligations and on their contractual obligations whenever the marginal uh, utility of zero delivery uh, they sell is higher than the marginal disutility of defaulting that is proxied by this lambda variable. If it's zero delivery, the marginal utility of consumption is less than the marginal disutility from defaulting, then they will default up to the level that the marginal utility is equal to the marginal disutility. Hence, delivery on contractual obligations reduces consumption and increases the marginal utility of consumption. Uh, technically, basically, you have this little relation, the on the verge condition with liquidity, whereby 1 plus the nominal interest rate times the marginal utility of consumption is equal to the marginal cost of default, that is this lambda. Uh, and agents will choose endogenously, so that's a choice variable, uh, uh, to equate these two costs, uh, and default will be compatible with the orderly function of the economy. If the left-hand side is less than the right-hand side, when default is not essential in the economy. So in other words, if we are in a very stringent economy where the default is punished by death, then we both preclude default. However, we kill the restating behavior of the agents. And conversely, if the right-hand side or the marginal cost is less than uh, the marginal cost is less than uh, is less than uh, the marginal uh, cost, then uh, default is unavailable. And then we have default by fate. Now, these are the main ideas of how we put default in a closed model, in a fully fledged general equilibrium model, and then in 2003, uh, and 2006 with Charles and Tom Suniran, we built a financial uh, economy, a model, a general equilibrium model with missing financial markets, heterogeneity in banks and a banking sector to analyze the interaction of financial instability and money. So basically, in a nutshell, the model uh, is a finite horizon model. It comprises of investors and commercial banks. We have a pure exchange economy, we want to abstract away from production. Later on, we introduce production and we have both inside money via open market operations of the government which, and the central bank, which initially we considered as, as if it was a strategic dummy. So we have inside money where we understand the distinction between inside money and outside money as it was understood by John Garley uh, in the 50s whereby inside money is uh, a liquid instrument where it, which is an asset to one balance sheet and a liability in somebody else's balance sheet, named the central bank and the investors. And then we have also money finance fiscal transfers, the outside money, whereby uh, there is money free and clear of any debt issued by fiat by the central bank and belongs equity and a liability to equity and an asset with the same agent. And we have fiscal policy and we also have regulatory uh, constraints. Uh, basically, the model has uh, can be thought as a playable game where in the first period people borrow, deposit, central banks conduct their monetary policy, uh, you have depositing, then you have market incompleteness where nature selects a possible state of nature, and then we have settlement of loans and deposits, settlement of interbank loans and deposits, and we have default and capital requirements violation penalties. And at the end of the day, banks are all wound up and equity uh, is being distributed and dividends is being distributed back to their legitimate owners. So basically the market structure, that's what summarizes uh, the whole model, uh, where basically we have the investors and the households and the commercial banks that they interact via commodity markets, via investors, credit markets, asset markets, 
by the internal credit market where the commercial banks interact with a consolidated central bank regulated the government and government and then you have the equity markets where the households own commercial banks and asset markets whereby investors interact with the commercial banks to ensure against unforeseen contingencies in the future. So in a nutshell, this is the schematic market structure of the model, and then one can very easily, uh, one can very easily describe the model mathematically by the corresponding optimization problems, market clearing conditions, and rational expectations. What's the benefit of this model? Is that one can basically uh, establish uh, the transmission mechanism, the transmission mechanism of financial instability, whereby monetary policy controls interbank rates, interbank rates control credit spreads of commercial banks, and then prices, asset prices are uh, prices, asset prices are determined. Likewise, fiscal policy uh, enters the commodity markets, and then you have again interbank rates. Uh, uh, nominal interest rates and asset prices. And the regulator has intervention at the different point of transmission mechanism where directly uh, affects via capital, liquidity requirements, and other regulatory measures, interbank rates and nominal interest rates. And all of these three policies that oftentimes are complementary affects the liquidity and the default in the economy and ultimately wealth. Mind you, because you have heterogeneity, welfare now is actively affected by uh, uh, government policy. Proceeding, we have, as in any uh, closed general equilibrium model, the goods markets, the money markets, uh, the internet markets, uh, the asset markets, the bank shares markets, and finally, the new variable that default introduces is the delivery rate on every asset sold in the interbank loans, which is equal to the amount that agents choose to repay divided by the value of their promises. Due to active default, the delivery rates are lower than one in equilibrium. Mind you that you have uh, the old, uh, I may, if I may say, uh, defunct models before the global financial crisis, where default was an anathema and it was not well dealt with. Now, after the global financial crisis, then economies started introducing, introducing uh, default spreads and credit frictions in the models to address the new issues that were uh, introduced after the global financial crisis. But like Cudi and Woodford, still default was is an out of equilibrium phenomenon. Unlike economies of international finance and sovereign debt analysis, where they had already borrowed from Schubik, uh, Holmstrom, and uh, Hart and Moore their ideas and from corporate finance more generally, and they had introduced in uh, sovereign debt active default in equilibrium. And I refer here explicitly to what Eton and Gershowitz did, Buell and Rogo and uh, Krugman, where the trade-offs between debt forgiveness and uh, re uh, restructuring and rolling over of uh, debt were first analytically and formally introduced. Uh, so basically, after we do this, then we have the standard, uh, the standard household problem where households maximize their welfare uh, from consumption minus the disutility from uh, default. Likewise, we have now an active banking sector, unlike the Bernanke, Gelter and Gilchrist approach, whereby whereby banks are more, more or less mechanical objects that they just intermediate uh, mechanically credit extension. Our banks have uh, different degrees of risk aversion and they have different capital uh, bases. What do we get from a model of that kind. First of all, the key thing is that we get a non-trivial quantity theory of money proposition. What does this mean? And that's a very important uh, point, is when we change monetary aggregates, we affect both prices and quantities. 
So you have a genuine interaction, genuine interaction of the real and the nominal sector of the economy along the lines that have been introduced in the old uh, Keynesian economics, where wealth effects matter. They have wedges, and wedges change prices, change quantities, and transaction costs uh, change the resulting equilibrium allocation. Now, the velocity of money, as we all know, uh, is less, is always uh, less than one. Uh, however, with securitization and liquidity in advance uh, for assets, leverage and the like, velocity can become greater than one. And that's a very interesting paper uh, in an infinite horizon uh, framework that uh, Juan Francisco Martinez, who is now in the Bank of Chile, and myself uh, put forward in 2018. Now, the second big property is that we have a non-trivial term structure of interest rates. You see here that uh, in the left-hand side that all the interest rate payments adjusted by repayment rates on short-term loans in uh, the present, short-term loans in the future, as well as intertemporal loans, should be equal to the sum of private outside money, private liquid wealth. In other words, this is the private liquid wealth of the investors, this is the private liquid wealth of banks and the equity of banks. And this is basically the important thing that ties in the nominal and the real sector of the economy. So nominal and real interest rates are uh, co-determined contemporaneously in the economy. What does this mean? And that was a point that was established by Espinoza and myself back in 2013. What do I mean that the classical dichotomy, that the Sargent type of models, Sargent and Carrick and Wallace, Sargent does not obtain in this model. Uh, more importantly, uh, we also have the Fisher effect, uh, whereby affecting nominal variables affects always affects always real variables allocationally rather than directly via changing aggregate endowments. And therefore, we may have dead deflationary and the Fisherian dead deflationary dynamics reappear in a fully fledged general equilibrium model and something that has been established by Lynn uh, Tsomokos and Vardulakis of the Board of Governors and the IMF uh, in 2015. Uh, the next point, which basically uh, in a way summarizes uh, the workings of the model, is the issue of determinacy. In this model, we don't have multiple equilibria as farmer and or cash and shell have propounded a long time ago. In this model, we have local uniqueness at a, very, at a fairly general framework with very, very mild conditions, as long as we have uh, positive interest rates. Essentially, if you have uh, the government budget constraint being binding in every period, so if you have a Ricardian policy, as has been uh, argued by Barrow, in back in the 80s, then you have multiple equilibria and you have nominal indeterminacy. Uh, however, uh, if you have complete markets, this determinacy, indeterminacy will be nominal. And if you have incomplete markets, so you cannot ensure against all unforeseen contingency, then you have nominal and real indeterminacy. However, however, if you have if you have positive liquid wealth or positive default in the money markets, in other words, if there is a transaction, a liquidity premium or a credit risk premium in the credit markets, that is commensurate with positive interest rates that gives determinacy and determinacy is isomorphic to the non-neutrality of monetary policy. And this result in absolute generality has been established by Romanidis and myself uh, in 2019. And this is a very, very similar point with what Jacques Dress and Heraclis Polemarchakis have argued that if the liquid wealth, which is equal to the seniorage, is redistributed within the same period, 
than the Ricardian policy obtains, hence you have indeterminacy and multiple equilibria. However, if you have non-Ricardian policies, then you fix uh, interest rates and hence you have determinacy. Now, uh, basically, here we have uh, the crux of our argument that if we have all agents and banks payoffs uh, to be nicely behaved, in other words, if you guarantee smoothness and differentiability, and if you have an equilibrium where agents consume positive amounts uh, and some agent uh, hoards money or saves money for the next period for interpretable smoothing, then any change of the government or the regulatory uh, policy results into a different equilibrium in which uh, some agent some agent changes behavior. And that's basically in absolute generality the concept of non-neutrality. The proof of this theorem, basically you need to, you don't need to follow uh, the technical argument, uh, rests on the point, rests on the point that if you have trade, actual trade and heterogeneity, then uh, and uh, you have liquidity needs and credit markets are active, then there is a wedge between buying prices and selling prices. So when you sell, uh, if you will, your consumption, you get the price. But when you buy the consumption by leveraging up yourself because of the transaction demand for cash, is not only the price that you pay, but also the interest payments. And this wedge between buying and selling prices is what determines and guarantees monetary policy non-neutrality. Please observe that this argument, uh, the only requirement that it has, it has to have more than one good because somebody buys consumption, somebody else sells a commodity, and to have more than one guy. Yes, which is the model that has only one good and only one guy, the representative agent model. So you realize that basically the class of models that depend on representative agents correspond to a measure set to a, to a set of measure zero. In all normal models where you have heterogeneity and many commodities, non-neutrality, hence policy intervention and policy matters. Now, as I promised, uh, the definition we came up uh, with financial instability uh, in the work with Charles is an economic regime, a regime is said to be financially unstable if inter alia you have a, a number, but not necessarily all of the households and banks to default, with now necessarily becoming bankrupt and the aggregate profitability of the banking sector decreasing significantly. So basically you need both a liquidity crisis as well as a banking crisis to, to, be, uh, to precipitate in a financially unstable economic conjunction. And why I care? about the financial instability because in a heterogeneously uh, modeled economy, financial instability causes externalities and welfare reductions via uh, the wealth effects that default and liquidity cause. Uh, now, the problem that I want, this is so basically that summarizes the conflict of liquidity crisis and a banking crisis, and this is a distinct situation from a recessionary environment. Now, uh, when we go and we do the objectives of financial uh, instability, the achievement of financial instability is always, uh, is always more tricky, trickier, more difficult and complex than the accomplishment of monetary stability. Unlike price stability, financial stability cannot be readily measured, model or forecasted, and moreover, it deals not with central moments of the distributions, but with tails of distributions, and always, always is more difficult to deal with tails of distributions. There is no straightforward instrument that the central bank can use to counter deviations from the desired equilibrium, and such mechanism as can be deployed, such as capital adequacy requirements, have to be agreed at an international level. Hence, financial 
the analogy of financial stability is a way more complex exercise with many incentive problems uh, that one cannot face in monetary policy. Uh, now, in the interest of time, I'll go and talk straight about the implications, uh, the implications of uh, the model, where ba basically when uh, capital constraints are binding, more expansion in monetary policy may lead banks, in some cases, to gamble to resurrect, in other words, to adopt riskier strategies, and liquidity injected by the commercial, by the central banks, can be used uh, by banks to leverage up, expand their loans to the non-bank private sector, uh, be involved in securitization, so on and so forth, and uh, banks may ultimately end up uh, worsening their capital position. Thus, expansionary policies uh, cause excessive loan expansion and can lead to financial fragility. And that's reminiscent of the mechanism that, because of unduly optimistic expectation, was first uh, proposed by High Minsky back in the 60s, where the word financial instability was not even in the jargon of uh, financial economics. Moreover, agents uh, may have more investment opportunities, uh, so larger banks with a more well-diversified portfolio can deal with negative external shocks more efficiently, more effectively, and more resolutely by restructuring their portfolios quickly, and such restructuring may put even more pressure on other agents that have more restricted portfolio or, if you will, fewer degrees of freedom. Uh, and we see this with an increasing inequality, uh, a wealth inequality, and equity inequality between the big banks, the small banks, and the North and the South, if you will, after the global financial crisis. Last but not least, uh, an improvement, uh, an improvement uh, such as a positive endowment shock, which is concentrated in one part of the economy, does not necessarily has welfare improving effects to the entire economy. So the transfer paradox, where we, which we know from the international trade models in the 70s, may reappear in the, uh, in the guise of financial instability. So the key features uh, of our model is heterogeneity, market incompleteness, uh, liquidity and default of financial institutions, that has an impact of both nominal as well as real variables, and aggregate default depends on fundamentals, and therefore we can simulate and calibrate our model. The algorithm that we use, uh, the algorithm that we use to calibrate our model first uh, and to implement the model in various economies is to identify the relevant question. For example, if you go to Latin America, the problem is which they have export-led growth is the exogenous shock on the price of their main export, which is copper. If you go to Italy, the main shock is the value of the non-performing loans. If you go to the Eurozone debt crisis, you had twin crisis, and then you had austerity that decimated. So basically the bankruptcy code was altered and the restructuring opportunities were not uh, aligned properly. So first we identify the relevant question, then the general framework that they presented, so that's why I'm uh, reticent calling this a model, I'm, it's more of a framework. We reduce the number of markets, banks, investor sectors and assets, and the time periods, uh, and then we calibrate the initial equilibrium with the equilibrium that we want to dissect, uh, and then we perform sensitivity analysis under different shocks. And now this model, one can take it with this kind of monetary and financial stability modeling. Uh, we took it and we analyzed Basel II and procyclicality. In fact, uh, way beyond before the crisis with Katarineu Rabay, Patricia Jackson, who was the bridge representative in the Basel committee, we had kind of foreshadowed the procyclicality of the uh, implementation of Basel II and that uh, situation was uh, patently obvious in 2008. Then uh, we can do mortgage crisis, banking, uh, 
and we have done work with Charles and Alex Vardulakis, and also uh, we introduce uh, non-bank financial institutions together with hedge funds to see how shadow banking affects all these arguments. Uh, last but not least, uh, we opened the model. Uh, we opened the model to international considerations, and we try to study uh, the eurozone debt crisis uh, and also international regulation like dividend restrictions and the like. Now, the further challenges, if you wish, as well as capabilities of this model is to combine the trackable dynamic analysis of the DLG models that fared so poorly before the global financial crisis with a richer uh, framework, with a richer framework, uh, institutional framework, and more rigorous economic modeling. Already, that's uh, where we have brought our research uh, efforts, and that's where the usual suspects now are heading, and we have already uh, have established some recent uh, advances, uh, talking about optimal bank regulation in the present of credit and run risk. So the diamond divic approach of bank runs, we have tried to incorporate it in a fully fledged general equilibrium model, we have talked about the interaction of liquidity and default in a DSG model with Martinez. Uh, we tried to argue uh, in a paper with Charles and Professor Pieris that uh, the restructuring that took place in Greece, or, the, or if you will, the punitive uh, austerity measures of the European Union uh, towards the South was Pareto suboptimal and a more lenient uh, debt restructuring uh, and rolling over of uh, the debt of the Eurozone might have positive welfare effects. And finally, we took this model and we analyzed uh, the Russian economy and uh, the Chilean economy using uh, an estimated DSG model along the lines of the framework that they just presented. So, on that note, let me pause and I would be happy to receive questions, comments and the like. And thank you very much for attending.